Bear on Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, Tom Waddle in the building. An absolute honor to have Waddle back on the podcast to break down this new look offense. There is so much excitement on this offense. Tommy, how are you? I'm good, Pat. Uh, I'm honored. I, am I pinch hitting for the good kid? Uh, Johnny uh, today is, uh, today's Wednesday. You're pinch hitting for J-Mac, who I oh! believe is uh, down in Mexico having a really good time. I saw the pictures. I saw the pictures. Oh, yeah. I'm he's freezing, living it up right now. I'm freezing my ass off here in the northern suburbs, and everyone, Yurko's down playing golf, J-Mac's in the, uh, in the islands. Good for them. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I think that I would say first and foremost, Pat, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, but, l- look, I think that, that – You know, for a rookie quarterback stepping in to a new environment, I can't imagine that there has been a better environment for the first overall pick in in decades. I think we went through this process a while ago, and I think the last time a rather decent team drafted first overall, I think, was when the Rams moved up to draft Jared Goff. But that team wasn't nearly as, as ready to win as that Colts team that drafted Andrew Luck several years ago. And I think that would be the comparison in terms of teams that are kind of built with the infrastructure that's necessary for a young quarterback to, to have a chance early yeah. on. You know, we had Ryan Poles on our show, Waddle and Sylvie in the afternoon a couple of weeks ago. And, and the thing that, that kind of stayed with me most, Pat, was when Ryan talked about the quarterback position and I asked him the question, you know, what did you learn from being in, Kansas City when you guys went through the process of of evaluating Patrick Mahomes, drafting Patrick Mahomes, and then developing Patrick Mahomes because people don't see the whole process. I mean, like talent identification is one aspect of it. And then you got to develop that talent. It doesn't matter if we're talking basketball, baseball, football, whatever the sport is, you know, there's 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 more than one component to finding, you know, long-term success and the word that ryan used when we talked to him about it was infrastructure they learned that you have to have the appropriate infrastructure in place for a young quarterback to really to to feel comfortable and thrive and look i i think you look back over the last three years and that infrastructure did not exist for justin fields specifically in his rookie year and in his second year his rookie year stepped into, I thought, a horrible situation where Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy were trying to win games to to hang on to their jobs. You know, the, the fact that they put him in in that Cleveland game with really no complete plan to protect him, I thought was football. Jason Peters. Yeah, it was it was football cr- uh, criminal. Um, yeah. And then last year was, you know, look, it was a design teardown. And, and I thought it was the right decision by, by the, the front office, but it was – It was just unfortunate for Justin. So I guess the point I'm making is is that as bad as the infrastructure was for Justin, and he was the victim of bad timing, and we've had this conversation a ton, a number of different things that went into why this didn't work. Um, The infrastructure for, let's just assume it's Caleb Williams, is going to be pretty damn good. When you look at, you know, the, the, the different diversity in the backfield, guys that can catch passes, guys that can run, guys that can protect your wide receiving crew. Like, I mean, what rookie quarterback wouldn't want to step into a huddle and see DJ Moore on one side, Keenan Allen on the other side. And maybe if the draft falls in the right direction, a Roma Dunze or a Malik neighbors in in that huddle as well, along with Cole Komet and Gerald. I mean, like this is a really, they've done a nice job putting the infrastructure in place. Now I would love to see them do some, some more, on the offensive line, because I think yeah. that, you know, it's something that all young quarterbacks, especially in the interior of that offensive line, you got to be comfortable with. But um, I give Ryan Poles and his guys a lot of credit for creating that infrastructure. And as I said, you know, part of me is is very empathetic for what Justin had to go through. I mean, victim of bad timing. Did he need to play better? No doubt. I mean, that's my opinion. But uh, it just the table was not set for him. And I think that in a, you know, I mean, it's not perfect, but I would say that if you're a rookie quarterback stepping into a situation, this table's set pretty nice. No, yeah, a hundred percent. That that is what gets me excited and what we got to get into on today's episode because there's there's so much that is set here for whoever steps in. We think it's gonna be Caleb Williams, but for whoever steps in to succeed, we also want to let you guys know today's episode is brought to you by the Hard Rock Casino of Northern Indiana, Las Vegas style gaming, just 30 minutes from Soldier Field, exit six, right off I-80-94. All right, Waddle. Mm-hmm. I, I I gotta 
ask you this because you you mentioned kind of what's being set up here, how the Bears have set things up. What is your expectation now of this offense in year one with a rookie quarterback coming in? Because there's still some things we need to address on the offensive line for sure, but I think maybe you'll probably go through the draft with that. Courtney reported here yesterday that it seems like Ryan Bates is probably going to be the starter or is in the in the running to be the starting center for this team. So I we'll, we'll see if that ends up coming to fruition. But what is your expectation to start things off just with the weapons you have on this team, your minimums that you need to see from this offense next season? I, I don't know that you define it by statistics, but like it, it's the eye test. It's that you're not one dimensional, you're two dimensional, you, 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 you compromise defenses, you stress defenses out, you make it difficult for them to game plan against you. Um, you show them multiple formations and, and multiple sets and different guys contribute. Um, look, I think DJ Moore, I, I told anybody who would listen, I, I knew he was a good player. The first moment I saw him step on the field of minicamp, I, I said, well, there, there's your best player regardless of position. He's your hardest, one of your hardest workers. He practices as hard as anyone. He doesn't take plays off. He doesn't, he catches the ball with his hands. He's explosive. He's in and out of his breaks. There's no waste of motion. Like he's just a fabulous football player. Um, he's going to stress some people out there. He had over 1,300 yards receiving, and what was it, seven or eight touchdown passes? And then Cole had a lot of a lot of production as well. But that was kind of it. So I yeah. think that you know, while those guys are excellent football players, you need to be able to stress a defense in in more than two ways. So I think that my my expectation is is that you're going to see a a, a balanced offense. You're still going to run the football. Uh, that's just, I think you still have to be able to do that. You're going to run the football to open up play action. But I, my hope is, is you're going to see a more consistent passing game. It has to be better. You got to average more than 195 yards per game uh, throwing the football, or you just don't make defenses, you know, worry or work hard enough. So, um, you know, I, I my concern, or, or one of the things that I'm interested in seeing is, again, the assumption is it's Caleb Williams. How will he play in a structured offense? Because what he's coming from is basically just snap the ball and then create. Yep. I mean, that's what Lincoln Riley has promoted. It's worked for him. Uh, that doesn't, in my opinion, that doesn't work consistently in the National Football League because the guys on the other side of the ball are just too good and too fast and too athletic. So can he – I liked his film better in 2022 than I did 2023 because you saw him play on time more. You saw him play more in structure. I think this year – Based on what was going on, he he probably played too much hero ball, and it got him in trouble. So you gotta you gotta kind of get back into the mode of playing within the confines of the offense. You don't want to neuter the guy completely, but you gotta play within the structure of the offense. So to me, that's what I think I'm looking for, at least from the quarterback position. But think about it as well. We just talked about it a moment ago. Uh, the comfort level of a young quarterback, like Keenan Allen, is is. <laughs> He's a technician. He's like it, it, he plays the position, and not to be overly dramatic, but he's an artist. Yeah. Like he plays the position different than DJ, and I like that because you don't want a ton of redundancy. Uh, Gerald Everett is a different tight end than Cole is, so I think Keenan is is going to be where he needs to be in crucial moments. There are going to be layups on third downs because he knows how to get open, and he's going to be exactly where he's supposed to be. He's going to be a young quarterback's best friend. Um, I just think it's going to be fun to watch. I think it's going to be fun to watch what they can do to to stress other you know opposing defenses. Yeah, and it's it, for the first time in Chicago. I've, I'll say in my lifetime. I mean, listen, you played for maybe maybe it was a little different when you were on the team, but like this is the first time where it felt like you set a quarterback up where it was hard to fail versus setting him up where it's going to be very difficult to succeed. We Realistically, our last six years of QBs, we've set them up in situations where you went, okay, how the heck is this guy going to yeah. you know, get the football out when the offensive line has fallen over itself or you know, when you don't have weapons on the field, when your best weapon is Amir Smith-Marset or Equinamius St. Brown. And, and now it's almost like you're bringing a quarterback in and I was a Justin guy, but like I'm excited for the fact that we're bringing in a a quarterback friendly system for development. I think, yeah. When I think back to like quarterbacks that we've drafted, my mind went to Rex Grossman because I was like, 
he was so, so up and down and more down than up here. Why? Because in college, I think people a lot a lot of people forget he was a good quarterback. Yeah, he was a really good. He was like thirty four touchdowns, eleven interceptions. Good. He had figured, but we didn't have the infrastructure for him to come here and be successful. He also dealt with some injury as well, but didn't have that infrastructure for him to come in here and be successful. So you couldn't nurture that and develop it and let him ease into it. You talk about the difference in systems. Yeah. I think we have that where Caleb Williams can go. I, I got to kind of figure this out as I go, but also this guy's about to hit me and Keenan Allen's running wide open because he's 6'3 and he can catch it anywhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I think it, it, it benefited Justin Herbert out in Los Angeles with the Chargers. Yeah. I mean, when you've got Keenan Allen and you've got Everett as a tight end, you've got Austin Eckler, you got Mike Williams when he's healthy. Um, I, I don't think there was any doubt that that helped him along in his development. Look, I mean, there are exceptions to the rule. I know no one would have said last year that the Houston Texans had the infrastructure for C.J. Stroud to play the way that he did, and he did. Some, but, you know, that was a historic season by C.J. Stroud. Most guys aren't going to do that. We may find out that either, A, there's a bit of regression from him next year or going forward, or he's just going to be a brilliant player in this league. But what he did this past season with a very moderate group of talented players around him was was spectacular. But – most guys, even as talented as they are, they need they need guys around them. And, and I think that there is stability. Look, I said a thousand times, Pat, I never confused Luke Getze with, with Kyle Shanahan, but I don't think Luke Getze was the football devil. Um, but he was a first-time play caller, and there are some bumps along the way with an imperfect environment that kind of, I think, hindered the development of a quarterback. That's been eliminated. Like Shane Waldron, again, I can't sit here and tell you he's the second coming of Kyle Shanahan, but he's called plays in the league. He's game plan. He's got experience. And now you've got weapons in that huddle. You've got a, 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 an offensive coordinator that's been there and done that to a certain degree. So, um, look, I'm not going to say that, that they're a Super Bowl you know, contending team because I don't think they are. But, like, if this team doesn't show dramatic improvement, especially on offense in the 2024 season, I'll be vastly disappointed for sure. Yeah. It, it it would be a major surprise. I, I mean, like, you think about <laughs> – I, I was trying to put together, like, teams that have put a quarterback in this position with the wide receivers and things that they have. I, I guess San Francisco, right? But like, it was the last pick in the draft. Like, that's kind of the the one team that you look at and go, like, it's not for the first pick in the draft, though, right? Like, even top top fifteen, right? Like, maybe Pat Mahomes, but he sat his rookie year. That team was built for Alex Smith to succeed, and Pat Mahomes was just that much more amazing, yeah. and they were willing to move on. So, like, this is a special situation that the Bears are putting a quarterback in. Here's here's my question to you, though: How do you keep everybody involved in this, especially? with a young guy coming in that's going to be learning on the fly. Cole Komet had a nice season last year. DJ Moore and Keenan Allen both had really good seasons. Gerald Everett was a guy that, when targeted, caught 70% of his passes. How do you keep everybody involved in the offense so that you make sure that you're that deadly offense? That's the job of the offensive coordinator, to make sure that, you know, week in and week out, uh, you put together a game plan that you know can to take advantage of what the opposing defense is doing. And, and I think it's matchups. I think you use motion. You do a lot of different things. I mean, again, think about if you draft a wide receiver at nine, and, and you know, there will come a time where Keenan Allen's going to be your three. DJ will be your one. This guy eventually will be your two, and Keenan yeah. Allen's going to be your three. Like, it's up to the offensive coordinator to make sure with motion and formation that Keenan Allen, who's going to be matched up with the third best corner on the other team, is is going to eat every Sunday. I mean, like, that's that's – I would think that Shane Waldron is very excited about the possibilities, but I, I think that, you know, there's, there's enough to go around. There really is. And when, when, when Keenan Allen is, is the focal point of the offense, it's going to take pressure off of DJ Moore. And when DJ is the focal point, for whatever reason, Keenan's going to find himself in advantageous situations. You can't be predictable. You can't do the same thing over and over and you can't rely on one or two guys. You got to be able to spread it out. You got to be able to have confidence and, in everyone. And I think that that'll also be an adjustment for, for Caleb Williams. Um, I think young quarterbacks lock in on things that they make, they feel, make them feel comfortable. I think you saw that last year with, with, with DJ and Justin, and it was a dynamic connection I think you got to make sure that, that Caleb is somebody that sees the entire field and doesn't just lock in on one guy because there's a certain comfort level. So 
um, you know, that's the job of the coach. You got to make sure that uh, that you spread it around and you make sure that you don't focus on one or two things. I, I think that's the that's the part for me where it's like the biggest question to me isn't the players on the field. The biggest question to me is Shane Waldron because we saw the tale of two Shane Waldrons out in Seattle, right? We saw the one who was like oh, 12 personnel all day. Let's attack the middle of the field. Let's make sure we get in the run game involved. Let's dominate out here. And then last year, you know, from every, from all oh, lack of a better term, all the Seattle guys that we've talked to have said, a lot of your concerns that you had with Luke Getze are similar concerns here with Shane Waldron. But at a minimum, he feels like they've all felt like he can develop the quarterback at a high rate. So it, it, it's kind of a concern to me on, okay, what kind of Shane Waldron are we going to get? Because he had a ton of weapons out in Seattle. And I think that a lot of them felt that there was a lack in production when, when trying to utilize uh, uh, those weapons last year. And, and you had Geno Smith kind of just lock in on guys and do a lot of the things that we were concerned about. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting uh, 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 lead up to this season. Might I say, let me ask you from the wide receiver perspective, though, what was what were you seeing that receivers were doing that maybe wasn't allowing them to get the football from Justin or that Justin was doing that wasn't hitting the receivers that you want to see change coming up into this season? Well, I think, you know, I, I mean, this is kind of taking several steps back. The, the difference between the, the college game and the NFL game is 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 significant. Uh, open at the NFL level is different than open at the collegiate level. Uh, the windows are short or smaller. The timing is different. And um, I mean, you just have to be willing to step back and let it rip. And, and I think we saw that a little bit at the tail end of last season against the Atlanta Falcons with DJ. And I think there were some moments when we saw that, but you know, you, you just have to trust that a ball thrown into a tight spot. And, and, that was one of the things, Pat, last year I said, I would have rather seen Justin make some mistakes and throw some interceptions and take some chances versus not take chances. And I think you have to be aggressive. And I don't think the ag aggression can be taken away from you because you make a few mistakes. I think you got to keep pushing the ball down the field. And I think that's the biggest difference is, is open in the NFL is different than open at the collegiate level. And I just never thought that – never thought, first of all, I, obviously Justin and DJ were on the same page. But if you go back and look at the film – he and Darnell, and I know they were good friends. It just didn't work. You know, Darnell yeah. Mooney, I, I mean, look, the, the league still likes him. He signed a three-year, $30 million deal, you know, with the Atlanta Falcons. So um, it just, for whatever reason, they were never on the same page. I go back and look at some of the plays in the Cleveland game, and and there were moments where I just was, I was scratching my head saying, like, guys that have worked together for two, three years, and, and they're just not on the same page. And sometimes it just doesn't work. Um but I would just say, like, the, be aggressive. Like, and that's what I always said about Justin. Trust it. See it. Trust it. Throw it. And there were times, I think, when he just – I think he was more concerned with not turning the ball over and not making a mistake. And when you're, when you're playing in that fashion, I don't think you're going to reach your potential. And I think that – I think that was part of his problem. And, and, I, and I do believe towards the I, – I said this against the, the Falcon, the Falcons game, Pat. I went back and looked at that film, and I think – Last home game Justin ever played. And I think he finally said, F it. I'm just going to let it rip. And if you go back and watch the film, he did it. He, that's what he did. He I mean, go back to the first drive. First play of the game, he, he, he trusts a throw on a slot fade and leaves it out there, and DJ catches it. I think the next drive, he throws the same play to the left side, and DJ's covered, but he allows him to make a catch. The touchdown pass in the corner. There was a deep end that he threw that through that I only think I saw him throw twice in three years in Chicago, where DJ leaned on the corner, created a little bit of space, and Justin threw it before DJ got out of his break. And I was like, where the hell has this been? Like this is this is what I wanted to see all along. And yeah. I think there was some reluctance for him to just cut it loose because he was concerned about making mistakes. And the hope is, is that I'm not asking guys to be reckless. But my hope is, is that Caleb Williams comes in and, and plays aggressively, not recklessly, but aggressively and will allow some of his his talented receivers go to make plays and and throw it into a tight window. If that's what it's called, you know, he's called to do. Does that go to the 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 staff to kind of instill the confidence in the QB that, hey, listen, we're not sitting you on the bench if you throw a pick here or does that kind of go to 
maybe more of the mental inside of the head of the quarterback. Because I would think a rookie QB coming in probably has some of the same concerns. I don't want to be the number one overall pick, and I leave this game, you know, feeling like I felt in the Notre Dame game where I'm, I'm sitting there watching footballs go the wrong direction all day. Yeah, you, you know, it's like I always said about cornerbacks. I think you have to say it about quarterbacks as well. You have to have thick skin and a short memory because you're going to make mistakes. Um, I just, uh, you know, I think that I heard – I heard Coach Flew say one time, I think, to us on his show, like when Justin came back from the injury, they really focused on, you know, whatever the numbers were, zero turnovers, you know, yeah. no sacks. The 200 number, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and basically what you're doing is, is you're, you're, I thought that you were just sucking the aggression out of the player. You focused more on not making mistakes than you were letting the kid thrive. And – and I think that that's you saw the numbers come down. You saw the sacks go down. You saw some of the things that that you were looking to see, but you still didn't see enough of the upside. But again, I think that you know, I think you got to tell whoever's playing that position be aggressive. Yeah. Don't be reckless, but be aggressive. And again, I go back to the Atlanta game, and and I think he just said last home game against you know the the that maybe I'll ever play in front of the Soldier Field crowd, and he let it rip. And I think if he had done more of that and not worried about making mistakes, you know, maybe he had a, a, a better shot at, at, at maintaining his spot here. But I guess the point I'm making is, is going forward, you can't play this game scared. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, if you see it, throw it. Trust it. Like, you, you've you played this position most of your life. You're working your ass off in off season in practice. You know what all the concepts are. You know what coverages you're going to get. You know, see it, trust it, and rip it. And if what for whatever reason a guy on the other team makes a play, you know that's that guy gets paid as well. So I just I want to see them be aggressive. I want to see them you know do some stuff that makes sense. And that that's my concern too. A lot with Flus and and you know kind of what how he's. I don't know if it's just him. I'm sure Luke Getzey probably had more of a say on the whole 200 thing, but the philosophy that we saw so many times last year was just do enough. If you just do enough, we'll win the game. And I think it lost you two to three games last year because you were like, well, we're up 20, 28 to three. We did enough. Then all of a sudden you're looking, it's like, wait, it's 28, 26. What are we doing here, guys? Like you, like the, the 200 number to me is like, all right, Justin, go out and score two touchdowns. Don't throw any picks. Don't get any sacks. I would hate to see that on Caleb because, all right, I got my two touchdowns. I've I've accomplished my goal today. All right, well, no, let's go bigger. Let's do a four hundred number. Yeah, can we get six hundred out here? Yeah, I mean, like if we're gonna if we're gonna do the numbers thing. Don't do two hundred because two touchdowns isn't enough to win in this NFL anymore. It just isn't. No, look, you're right about that, and. They were playing really good defense, and I think obviously they were trying to win games, and there was questions whether or not Flus was going to come back and who was going to be replaced at the end of the year. So I, I think there was more concern about W's than it was actually the continued development of a lot of guys, and and that's yeah. just the nature of the beast in the in the industry. And um, look, I, I my hope is is going forward that's not the case. Um, I think, you know, coaching staff will look at a quarterback and identify the things they think they do well and identify the things they think they don't do well. And they'll eliminate some of the things they think that they don't do well away from the game plan. And I think that there was a feeling inside that building, at least last year, that there was a limited amount that they could really go into the game each and every Sunday with. Um, and you got to I think you got to open up your, you know, your, your horizon here and and trust I know he's a rookie, but don't put any don't don't put any guardrails on him to begin with, if you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, give him everything and then rein it in if you have to. But don't you know, don't coach. I would say don't coach scared. Don't game plan scared. You're going to spend the first overall pick of the draft on this kid. He can do some wonderful things. Is he a finished product? Absolutely not. But don't bring him in here, in my humble opinion, and, and you know, and put the governor on him. You know, yeah. let him hit the gas. Let him let's see what he can do. Let's let him work through some mistakes. He's got a, a support system, you know, uh, in the coaching staff. He's got a support system in the offensive huddle. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm expecting. And listen, Pat, if they don't play well and he does, I'm going to tell you the same things about him that I would say about Justin. And that's what people don't understand. Like, I'm a Bears fan. You know, I don't care if it's, you know, 
who it is. I don't care if it's Peter Tom Willis or it's Sid Luckman. If that quarterback can play, he's my favorite quarterback for the team. So, um, you know, there there will be some leeway and there will be some understanding that rookies are going to make mistakes. But I would say while the infrastructure has improved and will be significantly better for Caleb Williams than it ever was for Justin, I think the bar is going to be set higher too. I think the expectation level because of that improved in infrastructure is going to be raised also. Yeah, and I think that listen, sure. you were a, a de- you, you were a defense that that took the football away at a high rate last year that's going to help a young quarterback. Yeah. You've got an offense like I mean, the closest thing I can think to it and I think this is a much better version of it is the 2013 Bears with Alshon and uh Brandon Marshall and, and Brandon Marshall and Matt Forte and I believe uh, Martellus Bennett, Bennett yeah. was on that team. Like that's the only thing that I can even think is close to that. But you had Mark Tressman at the helm for that one. So, yeah, Lance has told us many times kind of what that was like. You know, a lot of a lot of CFL highlights shown in the film room. So yeah, They I, were, though, Pat. I think his first year, I think they were the number two offense in the league. Like, it went sideways for a number yeah. of reasons that Lance, you know, obviously has more, more insight to than I do. But that offense, at least for the, the first year of the Tressman era, I, I mean, we were like, wow, we haven't seen this in, in quite some time. So. Yeah, the, the the defense did not show up on that one though. That was a, that was a tough year for us as far as that. It was a, there was like a fall off a cliff moment with that team too. It was that was a tough season for us. But hey, before we get you up out of here, Waddle, we gotta do our road to the draft. Brought to you by Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. We've got a lot of interesting wide receivers in this draft, and I think that there's a possible. Uh, uh, um, opportunity for the bears to build out not only just an offensive line but to add some depth to this wide receiving core seeing as how you got keenan allen who's 32 maybe still got a lot of good football left in him but you do have to think about the future of this what are you looking for from a rookie wide receiver on film right now from the college football level that you're like that's going to translate perfectly to the pros and who accentuates that right now that you've seen um I, listen technique is is ultra important when you take that step up in in class um what you got away with even as a you know uber talented player um at the collegiate level it, it gets ramped up it, it's a really you know it's it's a come to football jesus moment real quick in training camp because you know, if you're at Ohio State, Marvin Harrison Jr., who is a fabulous player, he probably plays against two, three corners a year that are difference makers ultimately at the next level. Well, yeah. at the next level, you play against those guys every single day. So um, it's not like, hey, there's one or two games a year where we're really going to be tested by the secondary of the opponent. Like that's every Sunday in the NFL. So I think for, for most guys, you can't just come out there and think you're going to out-athlete a an nfl cornerback so technique i think is ultra important um i don't think harrison's going to be available i think i think he's a fabulous player i think he's more of an angular guy on the edge you're not going to move him into the slot i mean you put him out on the edge and let him be an athlete and go up and get it and run past guys and just be big and physical i think neighbors is a guy that can play outside and inside and can do a lot of that you know quick twitch stuff uh, and I think Adunze can do a little bit of both as well, but he's a big bot- body guy as well, 6'3 and well over 200 pounds. So all three of those guys have tremendous physical attributes. Um, I think they all play the position in a really fundamentally sound way. I think you can find guys later in the draft that can do it too. You know, I mean, I think the the other kid at LSU, his name uh, escapes me, um, is a big strong player too that that you know is is going to be playing for somebody um you know i think maybe late first round maybe second round and there are a ton of guys like look at the best receivers in the league now you don't have to be a top five pick so uh but i think at the next level it, it you know uh, beyond just being a good athlete you have to you got to be sound fundamentally and, and i think that goes for every position though i think you talk to an offensive tackle if you know you can be a mauler, you can be a great athlete, but if your technique isn't sound, that guy across from you is Miles Garrett. And you know, I mean, he's gonna get the best of you. And even a midline pass rusher at the NFL level is gonna be as good or better than anyone you faced at the collegiate level. So you just gotta come in and work and make sure that you know you you don't take anything for granted. But again, I think you can say that for all positions. 
with the Bears being so locked in at there at Caleb Williams Pro Day, somebody snapped a picture of him leaving the airport. It was like, all right, we're rolling everybody out to go see what Caleb's got. I hope they're taking a nice long look at Brendan Rice as well, who's also having uh, uh, his pro day out there with with um, you know USC. Because I think, listen, if you get an opportunity to get a guy in the second, third round who's already played with the quarterback that you're expected to draft, he's going to understand the tendencies already. He's going to understand the the uh, the the how the ball comes off his hand. He's going to have a little bit of a head start on even some of the pro receivers coming in here because I've been catching footballs from this guy for the last yeah. two years. And he's Jerry Rice's kid. I'm I was just going to say, he's, he's been the best receiver coach in the history of the game, too, at home. So, um, yeah, I think you make a really good point. I think that, I mean, the problem the Bears have at the moment is, is they just don't have the currency. I mean, yeah. they're sitting on four picks at the moment. And, and I mean, we've had the discussion quite a bit. What do you do at nine? Look, if one of these receivers is there at nine, I, I will draft them. Uh, so, yeah. Walt, you know, offensive tackle, I think, from Notre Dame is there. I, I'm not moving down if – you know, if, if you feel like you've got a difference maker, uh, difference maker at defensive end or offensive tackle or wide receiver, I don't move out of the pick. But if for whatever reason you're not sold on someone at nine, I'm sure you can still find a dance partner and move back and, you know, reacquire some of that draft currency. I think what's tough here, let me ask you this. we There's going to be players there that you can be sold on for sure because of – Yep. No matter how the top board, there's only so many teams that can take players. Dallas Turner may end up falling. Yep. I don't know if he will, but he may, right? But if you can get an answer on your offensive line for 10 years, yep. do you take that maybe over the premier wide receiver? Because I think that's how people are talking about Joe Alt. I think that's how people are talking about uh, Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon. And yeah, maybe nine is a little high to take a center until you know that you've got a center that what Justin didn't have last year can snap and block. I don't think I'm asking too much from my center position to snap it and block. Yeah. I mean, that should be a prerequisite, right? Don't hit it. Don't hit me in the, in the, in the ankles with the snap every time. Uh, I think you make a good point. I think if you, if, if you told me that the Joe Walt is going to be a, you know, a seven, eight, nine time pro bowler at left tackle and, and not have to, you know, make a serious adjustment at the next level. You could sell me on it. I think it comes down. I can, I can, I can find a difference maker at the offensive line. I can find a difference maker at the wide receiver. Who's better at their job. And that's where I go. Cause I've got, you know, if I've got the choice, so who's better at their job. Um, I don't even think, like, I think you still need a wide receiver because think about it. I mean, Keenan Allen, I don't think you give up a fourth round pick and bring him in if you're not intent on signing him to a contract extension. My guess yeah. is, is that they're going to at some point come to terms on maybe a two year contract extension. At the very least, he'll be in Chicago for two years. Then what? Well, at that point, if you've drafted the receiver, then that guy just settles right in as being the number two guy. So, I mean, I can make a strong case for bringing in a wide receiver. I don't know how. Look, I. I I think Braxton Jones is a nice player. Do I ever think he's going to be a, a multi-time pro bowler? I'm, I don't know. I'm not an offensive line expert, but my guess would be no. And if you want to sell me on this kid is as good as, as at left tackle as we've seen in the last several years, like I'm not going to be stomping my feet and pounding the table if they come out of this draft with an offensive left tackle that everyone feels great about. That I mean, yeah. that's a bonus. Yeah, I, I I think that no matter what, one and nine is going to be very fun for us yeah. this year. I don't think there's any surprise players that like, you know, last year a lot of people were like, oh, you 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 didn't take the 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 nose tackle that you needed. He ends up going to Philly. You go out and get a right tackle. And it was like, well, the right tackle is pretty freaking good. I'm yeah. I'm happy with that. But you know, there was a little bit of upsetness with that. I, oh, yeah. I don't think this year. They could go anywhere, and I'd be like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. You know, I still think they're, they're probably a year or so away from being able to. I love Ryan Poles' approach. Like, and people got pissed, if you remember, in his first draft. Everyone was like, we need receivers, we need receivers. And with his first two second-round picks, he drafted Brisker and Gordon. Yeah. Everyone was pissed. You know, George Pickens was available. This guy was available. Well, Ryan Poles came into the Bears, and when he interviewed, he obviously gave them a game plan. This is how I'm going to GM. Like, if I'm ownership, if I'm George McCaskey, if I'm sold, this is how I'm going to GM. And then on my first draft, I basically go, well, I'm not going to take the highest-rated player on the board right now. I thought we could do – like, 
that would have pissed me off. Not drought. Yeah. yeah. And 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 if you got to stick to your principles, and over the course of a several years, your principles and sticking to your principles doesn't equate to victories, then you're going to lose your job. But I don't want you coming in and with a set of principles and then deviate from them at the very beginning. So I liked what he did while everyone was killing him for not drafting George Pickens. I thought he stuck to his guns and said, these were the best two players that we had on our board. We've got plenty of needs in our secondary. We're going to draft these guys. Um, I think that as you become a more talented and a deeper roster, you can adhere to your principles, but you can stray a little bit because when your roster's better, then you can start drafting on, on, on positions of need, not so much the highest rated player on your board, if you know what I'm saying. So like yeah. this year you get that wide receiver, you get that offensive tackle and, and maybe you sign a, a, a rush pass rusher at some point that, you know, middle of the line guy, but helps you, whatever the case may be. Well, when you get to the 2025 draft, when your roster is more secure, then maybe when everyone says, hey, who's the highest rated player on your board? And you're like, well, this is this guard out of Wisconsin. We're picking 23. And Ryan Poles goes, well, our highest rated guy was this guy. But we really saw something from this pass rusher from LSU. And we took him because we had a need there. Like that's where I think you can deviate from the plan and start drafting with regard to need versus best player available when your roster has been fortified over the course of several years. And I think they're in the process of doing that. Yeah. I'm not the, the, the only thing about the Pickens thing that hurts a little bit more is right after that, you go Valus. That's the only thing. That's, That's the cool. only thing that stays a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I, I'm not saying that all the decisions are the right decisions, but the, <laughs> the process is correct. If the process is correct, you know, yes. you're not going to hit on all of them, but yeah, that one will say, uh, look, I think that, He's got to have naked pictures on somebody up there. I, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know it, what it is either. Like, you know, you can't be great at evaluating every position. And we've talked <laughs> like he's got a blind spot a little bit, I think, or they do up in the building for wide receivers, whether it was yeah. Bayless Jones or Chase Claypool. What they have done, I think, is maybe notice that they have some of those issues. So they eliminated the risk by – DJ Moore, that trade isn't made unless DJ Moore's part of it. And you've heard Rob yeah. Pohl say that. And that was a great yeah. decision on his behalf. And then you trade a fourth round pick for a guy who, you know, is a six time pro bowler. And I mean, I don't have to explain why he's so good to anybody. So you eliminate some of that risk. And I think that, you know, I, there is some self awareness that has to go on in all walks of life. And I respect it. I, I respect too. that he's got it. Like, yeah. it's just like, Listen, we, we're on Valus and Tyler. Maybe there's still some hope for Tyler, but yeah. it, oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and you got to be willing to listen. It's some, it, it, and, and I think it's it's hard for a young GM because you want to stick to your guns because, yeah. you know, a guy like Howie Roseman or, or Eric DaCosta in Baltimore, you know, the guy in, in, in Kansas City, you know, Brett Veach, like you got skins on the wall. You can make those mistakes and you, yeah. you, you do your job a little more freely. When you're first time GM, I think sometimes you probably are inclined to stick with guys a little bit longer to say, hey, I, I, I couldn't have been maybe I was wrong on this guy, but I'm going to give him one more chance. And I think that Ryan has done a really nice job kind of pivoting sooner rather than later, especially for a, a young GM. But we'll see what the receiver room looks like this year. If it includes Bayless, I Maybe we're going to have to revisit this conversation. That's, that's Valus wide receiver three, baby. We might be in trouble. Uh, yeah. Tommy, we appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, make sure to tune in to Waddle on Waddle and Sylvie every day on ESPN 1000. Um, what any, any nuggets before we let you go, Tommy? Anything that you really want to see the Bears do? I just think uh, what I would say is, is, look, this has been a difficult time, a difficult transition for a lot of Bears fans. There's been a lot of consternation. There's been a lot of nastiness. Uh, there's been a lack of civility. I said this a bunch, Pat, last week. Look, at the end of the day, I think if you're a Bears fan, all we want is a team that competes for a championship each and every year. How they get there, we may disagree. But at the end of the day, we're all pulling on the same end of the rope. So I think that uh, time will heal some of these wounds for many, but I'm excited about the future of this team. Um, I think that the infrastructure is there for a young quarterback who will step into a nice situation. And I think 2024 should be a lot of fun, be a roller coaster like every season, but uh, I have some, some pretty high expectations. 
as an athlete, does it irritate you when like Joe from Schaumburg on Twitter is just like struggling to walk up the stairs in his profile picture? And he's like, no, nah, I just think that 40 times not high enough. I don't, I don't know. Man. It's, it's, I don't think he's got the hands for it. It's, it's, I got to tell you, I try to stay away from it as much as you can. I mean, but you are a human being. Like the ones that just get me or, you know, I'm, they call me a coward for my – opinion or I look like I need to get some guy was talking about I need to get in the weight room have you ever seen the inside of the weight room I was like yeah I've been in the inside of the gym <laughs> you know some dude asked me or said uh, you don't like being attacked do you and I was like my friend attacked is when Benny Blades hits you from the blind side while Ray Crockett's got his helmet in your chest plate not some silliness on Twitter okay so <laughs> I, you know, I try to not to, to swim in, in that cesspool, but every now and again, my friend, it just, it's so hard. It's, when, so hard. it's the best place to get Adam Schefter's updates. That's the problem. You like, know, I can't leave it. You nailed it. It's the greatest place in the world to, to gather information and disseminate information. And it's the worst place in the world to actually exchange ideas and have a conversation. Absolutely. Tommy, thank you for coming on this show. Anytime. For you guys out there, hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. Y'all leave Tommy alone on Twitter, man. I saw the, <laughs> I saw the guy that was like, hey, do you even lift, bro? It's like, it was you like, saw that. I, I don't anymore because I'm 57 years old. I can't get my arms over my head. <laughs> yeah, there's some NFL injuries that went into that. <laughs> I'll stay safe out there, Chicago. Peace.